Uh, my name is Isabel Berwick. I'm, I work at the Financial Times. I host a podcast called Working It about the modern workplace. And I am delighted to be rounding off the conference by talking to Sir Christopher Pisarides, Regis Professor of Economics at LSE and co-founder of the Institute for the Future of Work, Chris. Thank it's you. just a pleasure to be here. And thank you all for staying to the end of the day. It's, it's you know, what we're going to talk about is fascinating. So I wanted to start with a kind of broad brush question. Mm. Chris, could you outline the frame of reference for your review and how do you feel it's going? Now, the... Um the answer to the second part is very well. Thank you very much for asking. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the frame really is about the future of work, and we took our lead from the, uh, from the Commission on the Future of Work that, uh, that was uh, done through Parliament about uh, is it four years ago, maybe now, where there were obviously we saw concerns about what's happening to work with these new automation technologies coming along, robotics, artificial intelligence, and more generally, the structural changes that are taking place in the economy, the technological ones. Now, um, of course, you know, structural changes in any economy have been taking place since uh, the end of uh, agriculture as the employer of uh, 70, 80 percent of the population. And of course, Britain was a leader on the first industri industrial revolution. And um, I mean, it was always my view that uh, th there are more similarities between these different industrial revolutions than uh, differences. Of course, that was a different view taken by many, you know, the World Economic Forum more than anything, because I think the name Fourth Industrial Revolution is due to them. They were saying now it's completely different. I don't know if you've seen the books, the couple of books by uh, Klaus uh, Schwartz, for example. I, I don't really agree to those, uh, those extreme interpretations, but anyway, we agree that uh, given the evidence we collected during the um, uh, Commission on the Future of Work, there were a lot of things there to uh, uh, investigate further, especially if they apply to the UK. You know, there is the regional dimension, for example, you know, what's happening to London and what's happening to the rest of the country. Uh, there is the actual question of where are we going with automation uh, technologies, what's happening to uh, Britain with the much uh, reduced manufacturing sector and uh, services, uh, what do we need uh, to do with uh, education, upskilling. Uh, th th there, is, uh, th there is a myriad of questions that um, uh, can be asked and we set it up and that's what we've been uh, asking since then and, and uh, we're fortunate where is, uh, oh Mark is not here anymore, I guess he heard me enough times, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> fortunate to get this funding from the Nafit Foundation with a three year project to investigate that. Now one final uh, comment about where it's going, I, the, the emphasis that I like um, putting here because you might say well many 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 people are talking now about the future of work and now of course we were there along at the beginning but it, you might say it's in the time you moved on kind of thing um, but um, but I, I believe that we, we do have an issue we have moved on and that's the well-being part which I think the, uh, the well-being is all it, it's also f sort of fairly new new area in economics although there have been at least uh, one and a half Nobel Prizes actually given to it, so maybe it's not that new. You know, the whole economics of happiness and uh, subjective well-being. Um, but but that's, that's the emphasis. I, I do believe strongly that work should, um, should make people happy. They should feel good about their work. And, um, and, and that's what we're trying to find out how to achieve that. So in terms of the measures of well-being, is that essentially what it is at, at heart? How happy are people? Are they yeah, doing work? Yeah, yes, yes. I believe that the best measure of well-being is, is subjective. It, it's, it's, it's how, how satisfied you feel about your job or about your life or general. That, that's that's well-being. Um, um, I, I wish we were uh, Aristotelian in that because, of course, Aristotle was the first person to talk about ethics generally, but, but I think his view, as, um, as my colleague Richard Lea, it's the first time I mentioned him, but he deserves it. He's been such an influence on, on my life. It's, it's shame on me because 
of course, you know, he, he, he had the real classical education. He went to Eton and uh, Cambridge, <laughs> whereas I had the kind of classical education taught in Greek schools. Um, because that's where the original, you know, but the, the original class, <laughs> we pronounce it in different. We pronounce it the right way. That's the difference, you know. Class, but but of course Aristotle's uh, ultimate well-being, which which he called eudaimonia, eudaimonia in Greek, um, was that uh, you you should do is the public good. It's, it's not just you should feel happiest when you are doing something for the public good. Is it sort of that idea of something bigger than us? That yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. I, I wish we reached the point where we feel that, uh, or at least em employers feel that they're doing something, they're providing jobs for the public good for society as a whole, and that's what makes it, that's what would make an em a, a CEO happy if, if they provide um, jobs that uh, would be good for society as a whole, and maybe we should give them Nice translations of Aristotle's uh, yeah. Nicomedia and Ethics. We could get eudaimonia trending on LinkedIn. Yes. That would be helpful. <laughs> and that, and yeah. we haven't touched on productivity, and we hear a lot mm. about improving productivity. I think not yes. a day goes by in the Financial Times without some desperate story about British productivity, lack of. Do you yes. think that is the right priority? And um, what? Yeah, actually, yeah. Review? Actually, you're lucky you are not here this morning because I was very critical of those who write about productivity as being number one and not, <laughs> nothing else. Not me. <laughs> Although I would never criticize the Financial Times, of course. <laughs> it's my source of information of, on, on these things. No, no, I, no. I was critical, but um, you know, I mean, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know how many of you. Uh, Paid attention actually throughout the day, but uh, the, the, my my colleague and friend John Van Rienen provided the opposing view, which is you know that that, that the way people say that uh, you know put two economies together and you are going to get three views, and the third one is Keynes. <laughs> that um, I, I mean I do think that productivity is important actually. I mean I, I exaggerate a little bit by saying that that it's not nearly as important as as well-being, because when there are so many people interested in productivity, and uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a member of the of the Productivity Commission, run from the National Institute of Economic Research, for example, we are collecting we are in the, pro the process of collecting evidence now. But um, but productivity, it, it's what John was saying earlier today that that productivity growth is important because we can uh, we, we can improve our standard of living. But what he didn't say, and what I was emphasizing this morning, is that we can improve it financially. You know, we'll have more money to spend in relation to what's available for us to buy. You know, our purchasing power will be higher. But I think there is much more to, uh, to life satisfaction uh, once, you, once you exceed the threshold where you only worry about food, you know, animal life. If you watch, uh, you know, I'm fortunate to have it study with a w window overlooking a park and I watch the squirrels, all they do is, is eat. <laughs> Take things underground, up in the trees and things. Well, we, once you, we pass that stage, I suspect in a few million years maybe squirrels will pass that stage too, <laughs> then, then we, we, f f to improve our life satisfaction, I think we, we improve it more at the margin, you know, the, the, the marginal contribution to life satisfaction, if you like, uh, it's, it's, it's on things other about about the quality of life, you know, and um, how much dignity we get, uh, how much uh, satisfaction we get because we've achieved something. I mean, we're by nature creative animals. Um, how much creativity do we, do we exercise? Do we have any? You know, I mean, you have a good conversation with someone, and and you leave, and you feel so happy that it opens so many. Horizons, so many new things to think about, about life, about the origin of the universe, <laughs> about all kinds of things, you know. And, um, and, and, and all those things do not depend on productivity. You know, they, they, they depend on small things that our employer might give us. I'm fortunate to have a wonderful employer in the London School of Economics and its various directors where they give you complete freedom to be as creative as you want in any area you want, provided, of course, you perform your basic 
things that you have to perform to be a good teacher and good communicator of ideas to your students who to a very large extent pay for you to be there. Um, and, um, and, and, and that, that's why I think that um, we're exaggerating putting all that em emphasis on, on productivity. Now, now, of course, there's another aspect in the, in the international economy that, um, that, that maybe we should be taking into account, which is, which is sort of comp competition across nations, if you like. You know, like, like we're always talking about our competitors, meaning the United States, Germany, China, or whatever. And, and if they are growing faster than you, productivity-wise, they are going to do better than you. And in, in, in creative matters, international trade relations and all that. And, and I mean, from that point of view, it's important. It's something that's never, never attracted my, my attention, actually. I mean, I know I say, I mean, you say Greek national. I know Greece will always be at the bottom of uh, whatever rank countries when it comes to economic competitiveness. So it doesn't worry me. Where's the happy? <laughs> and we just touched on engagement there and happiness. Yeah. Does that feed into, pro is that a more better measure, you know, happy employees and engaged employees work harder? I mean, is that, yeah. is that really the, the, the way you would look at it? Yes, yes, they, 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 work, they, they work harder, but harder in the sense of not, not necessarily more hours of work, although it might be, but in a more creative way. And uh, paying a lot more attention to uh, um, what, um, they can do to improve the performance of the company because they feel part of the company. They, they feel themselves that they're stakeholders in a company when, they're, they're, when the job is good and when they're given more autonomy and, um, and better inter in interaction with their managers. Now, it, it, it's, very, it, it's very difficult to do in practice as, uh, as uh, something I recently read from the CBI explain, you know, but it's easier said than done. Um, I, I, I think actually as, as, as a start, information flow is important. It, it's to, to be informed of what's going on. If you are not uh, well informed, then you feel out of it and then you don't care as much and, and then it's a lot more difficult to um, I feel that you, you are in a good job where you are appreciated and all that because you are not even told what's going on. So communi really just basic communication might yes. be a massive lever in terms yes. of good work. Yeah, so the role of, uh, of comms people is extremely important. There's probably comms people here. But he's not listening to us. <laughs> <laughs> so to talk about autonomy, we, we, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, robots and AI, you know, before the pandemic, yeah. all the articles were about the robots yeah. for our jobs, and it kind of stopped, and now it's, I noticed it's kicked off again with all this generative AI. Yes. Uh, I mean, what's, what's the reality? What do you predict? Are, is AI and uh, robotics going to make our jobs easier, or are they just going to knock out a swathe of manual labor? I'm sure you know that ask any economist who predicts something, and will give you your own <laughs> prediction about anything. <laughs> What, so I'll answer, what could it do yeah, rather okay. than what would it do? Of course, it could improve our jobs enormously. Um, you were not here when Darren Simogli was talking from MIT remotely. He, he, was say, he was saying the same thing, really, which is not too surprising because he's a former LSE student. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the, uh, I mean, we, we, we could use a, a AI, uh, actually, to improve both the both our performance with respect to uh, criteria like the sustainable development goals, the environmental issues, though that, that, that's very important, of course. And, and, and also, I mean, a subject that has been very close to my heart since my graduate studies, which is the, 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 the quality of the match between, uh, between worker and job. In other words, um, the, the extent to which we can use our very specialized skills that we have as people, because we, we're so diverse in our capabilities as, uh, as, as, as people that it, it's not possible to write down what we are good at 
and make sure, and, and it's also equally difficult for a job to write down exactly what qualities they are looking for in a person, and therefore make sure that the combination of the person and the job is one that is more, most productive for, for, from the employer side and most uh, satisfying uh, from the worker side. And by using uh, AI more and more, you could find out more about exactly what's needed and what would be a, a, a good match and, uh, and, and learning. You know, it's like, it's like these new, new types of, um, of AI. I only had a long discussion about, uh, is it chat? GPT. With some initials, yeah. That, that the, more you, the more you use it, then the, the things it comes up with, the closer they are to what it, exactly to what you want to see and you want to write about, because well, they learn about you. Into an MA program, MBA program. Yeah, yeah and, 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 and that's it. You, know, you could use that in the job, and, and as you see the performance that you're doing in the job, you know, following what you are following on your um, screen and, and, and all that, then, then they discover much better your exact um, abilities, the, 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 the sort of capabilities you have, and then from there give you the best combination um, with respect to what the job is requiring and that will improve what you're doing. Now, what, what Daron was saying, which is very interesting actually, but many others, of course, we have said it, <laughs> I'm sure, Eric, myself, before in writings, is that, um, the, the, is that what, what a company might be doing when they're introducing new technology is to make sure that they are creating new roles within the organization where people would be better at. Um, th there is a good example from, from banking, for example, that uh, that now we have we, we have no um, uh, cashiers, kind of tellers, as the Americans were calling them. You know, they become automatic tellers, ATM machines, rather than those. But m most of those who are employed there have moved outside their glass screens and they stand at the entrance of the branch and they do customer relations. Now that's a new role for, for, for banking. You know, 10, 15 years ago, if you walked into a bank, you, you, could, you could never find someone to do, to ask you about uh, your account, what help do you need, what can I help you, you know, have a conversation. Um, and now they are there. And it's a good example where uh, a bank introduces an ATM machine to do, do your deposits and withdraw your cash and, and, and all that, and then it, it, it creates new roles for those who are doing those jobs, and those new roles provide a better uh, customer service. Now, the way it's going, of course, ATM machines will now be kicked out by new technologies, <laughs> which, are the, which are the payments, the uh, automatic credit card, yeah, yeah. So this the debit card of, payments. This development of AI is actually developing our human, you know, it's, it's allowing the flourishing of very human yeah. qualities. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, That's yeah, really to find. Interesting. Yeah. Be because there will always be jobs that humans will be better at, just because they have so many uh, diverse um, uh, capabilities, uh, skills, uh, which a machine doesn't. After all, a machine is trained to do things. It might, it, it might be trained to do things better than than we do. You know, they might become better at playing chess than we do. But it's just this narrow way of playing chess. If you're if you're playing your chess and then you want to have a cup of tea at the same time, the machine would be hopeless to do that. Whereas a chess player might get up, maybe tea, and come back, sit, and continue. So, is it possible that we can? So, in a lot of organisations, you know, you've got the job that is like this, and people have to fit the job. Might it be a yes. much more imaginative way of working in future, yeah, where you exactly, fit the yeah. job to the person and their skills? Yeah, that's the match. Yeah, that's what that's we're the dream. matching. Yes, that's the dream. Yeah. Uh, and um, is I'm also interested in might there be an end to sort of gendered stereotyping, or perhaps you know, gendered jobs might be less of a thing. This mm. has only recently occurred to me. Was this something within the scope of the review? Uh, we, we, we haven't, we, we're still at the stage that uh, we're looking at um, the, the sort of overall, you know, how, uh, how are employers responding to the new technologies, what are they doing, and how are workers responding. But uh, we are recording this, uh, so the gender, if there's any 
in, in any gender um, direction, if you like, by the employers or us doing it. So we should obviously bring it out. Of course, of course, with gender there is the, the there is the cultural thing as well, which is much slower to change than than technology. But 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 it is changing. You know, it's. Uh, I mean, look. I mean, look at our institute. Um, we are. Um, are we evenly balanced or more heavily? Men are in a minority. Of the three founders of the institute, I'm the only one. <laughs> oh, that could be the future of work. Yes, yeah. so <laughs> yeah, I, I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I like to it. Move on a bit from AI. I mean, the the biggest crisis, and I'm, is the climate crisis. Yes. Essentially, and there are so many implications mm. in this, and, and societal disruption, I think, is one that we we don't mm. talk about that much, apart from in the sense of people migrating. You know, how might technologies that are coming on, online now from the, what we might call the fourth industrial revolution or not, mm, depending mm. on whether we like that phrase, help us win out against, you know, the kind of heavy industry and the carbon heavy industries of the past? Mm -hmm. Well, we, we could start with, with small things there on the, on, on the environment. I mean, obviously, the ultimate objective is uh, sustainable energy sources because energy is... Um, is, is the big polluter. I think it's in something like 90%. I think that the same figure is incredibly high. Um, so we, we need to move in that, in, in that direction. And um, it's, it's the new technology that uh, will help us. You know, you've, you know, you've got wind in the North Sea. We've got sunshine in the Mediterranean. And all, all, all these things matter. We're, we're still way behind, actually. We're not uh, collaborating well across um, nations as well in the provision of that. Although, although there are movements now, you know, the, um, I, I, I can give you an example. There is, uh, um, like currently, for example, there is uh, a plan to move, um, uh, to connect Egypt with the, European Union via Cyprus and Crete up to, to bring solar energy from the Egyptian desert onto Europe, for example, you know, that would make a lot of difference. It, it, it's not easy technology, you know, the, the Mediterranean is a very deep sea between the, in the Eastern Mediterranean, mm -hmm. surprisingly deep actually, given how small it is. In the, um, but uh, but there are eff efforts go going on. But 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 we're not doing that. Even if you look within the European Union, um, you know Germany that uses a lot of solar energy in, in its industry. Most of the solar panels that it uses are located in Germany. We'll go and locate them on those uninhabited Greek islands that have a lot more <laughs> the sun than you have. You know? <laughs> so so obviously they. International collaboration needs to be a, a, a lot more than than we have. Then there are, I mentioned earlier, the example from agriculture. I mean, agriculture is um, is, is a big polluter, um, both uh, animal husbandry, but also um, you know the use of water. For example, water is something like seventy percent of the world's water resources go into agriculture, and most of it is wasted. Um, it, it's very easy to use, uh, and in fact, the, in fact, they, they, they are in they are in use to use drones to identify where ground is dry and make sure that you only water those dry parts that are identified, rather than just let the water run and flood all the fields because you cannot uh, direct it. And, and that that's that's the way to do it, you know efforts more. Now, how do you make people do it? I think we should use the, the tax system more imaginatively. Thank you. you know, tax more heavy yeah. than... Old school. Yeah. Old school. Oh, taxes. Oh, taxes. I mean, people respond to taxes. I mean, you know, I've, I've been getting um, messages these last few days, last few days. You only have five days to submit your tax return. And I've been shaking every time I <laughs> got <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> So pe people do respond <laughs> when you see tax, when you see yeah. tax, you say, ah. Yeah. I'm just going to break there. We've got some time for questions. So, uh, oh, it's people in the room with questions. Have we got uh -huh. a mic? We have. Right. Lady at the back here. 
Uh, hi, um, quick question. My name is Maria. I'm freelancer, but um, I used to work for a big organization. My question is around four day working weeks. It's been very popular since COVID and kind of been implemented in some of the organizations in the UK. What's your take on that? Do we do, do we, are we ready for four working days a week or do we need to do four days for 80% pay? Because everyone who's had a three day weekend mm. feels much more rested to do for yeah. good days of work. So what's your opinion? Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I'll give you the uh, brief answer, but if I could do some advertising for one of my former PhD students, there is a wonderful book written on the fourth day week by my former student, um, uh, Pedro Gomez. Have you, have you seen it? Yeah. Um, where he goes through all the arguments for and against. Let, let, let me, though, step back a bit and, and give you a, a, a bigger picture on the four-day week. I mean, there's no doubt that um, as, as incomes and standards of living increase, we're reducing, we, we're reducing our hours of work for those employed. You know, I'm not talking about people withdrawing completely. If, if there is, there's a very, very good correlation between... Um, Labor productivity measure very simply. Just take uh, national income of a country and divide it by number of hours of work. Um, and ca countries that have the higher, highest uh, productivity measure in that res respect have the lowest um, hours of work. The um, the, the the best um, you know, the, the, one of the highest productivity is, for example, if you look at Europe, the, the, Germany is the most productive country, Netherlands, um, Scandinavians, they work the fewest hours of work. If you look at, if you look at the other end, OECD, Mexico, Greece had the ones with the lowest productivity, they work longest hours of work, conditional on being at work. Therefore, as uh, living standards rise, we have to find a way of, um, of the, the best way in terms of life satisfaction, if you like, that we restrict the hours of work. And, um, it, and traditionally, and we know that, you know, why are bank holidays always on Monday here? We like to bunch hours of uh, off work because there is a fixed cost to doing whatever you want to do uh, out of work. In, in that, if you look at it that way, then the four day a week is the right way uh, to do it as we are uh, progressing on uh, on now pay will be higher necessarily but that's because that's what uh, will drive it now there are many many difficulties though that you have to face you know what's happening to schools for example um, then those three days you do need uh, people to provide you services you know food services travel and all that. how do you distribute the hours of work and that's why I told you about this sort of 200-page book that goes through me one by one, but I've, I've been I've been seeing more more and more actually that on the on the whole, I think on the whole writers are more favorable. But of course there is also self-selection. You know, like if you are going to write about if you are going to write a long document about a four-day week, then you better make sure you like it. You're not going to write it. Just kept criticizing, criticizing. But I, I personally, I do think it's a, it's a good thing. Yeah. I'm going to take one off the Slido. How should we understand dignity? Sen suggests that free, be free being who shapes his or her life in reciprocity with others. Does this mean participation is key? Oh, that's a deep one. Uh, Steve, well, if Sen said it, uh, yes, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. He, was one of, he was one of my teachers at the LSE. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay we'll take one in the room. Uh, man here in the seat. Oh, we'll just wait for the mic. Oh, we'll like, thanks. thanks. I, I like what you said about how AI and other technologies could help with matching, something you've done a little work on. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but it hasn't happened as fast as maybe some people, uh, in fact, I just noticed one of the questions from David Otter um, predicted some of this uh, 20 years ago. Um, what are some of the barriers that are preventing AI and digital technologies and other mechanisms from improving matches? I recently helped my, my niece get a job as an economist. She called her uncle to to introduce her to some people, and she ended up getting the job, which is good news, but that seems like a big failure for our, our systems overall, that that's the way she ended up getting her job. Um, it, it, you see, it's, it, it, it's interesting, actually. I mean, it's very difficult to find the matches, and of course, 
you know, the people who know you, it, it's, um, it, you know, it goes back, to, it, it, it doesn't sound fair, but in a sense, I'm sure the uncle knows a lot better. Actually, I, I would debate that. So I had to ask her, uh -huh. what courses did you take? And explain that to me. I, I know she's a good person. Maybe yeah. that's what's important. But I really didn't know as much about her skills as maybe some kind of a, a questionnaire would. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, that, that's where... Um, that's where AI and, uh, and, and universities, especially actually, do, that they should be able to identify skills uh, better in uh, promoting rather than recommending everyone, as I was saying before, that, that they're good. It's, it, it, it's, very, it's very difficult, actually. I mean, it has, I mean if, if I should be brave, brave enough to admit it, it has been puzzling me a lot. You know, like it, when, when, um, when internet uh, job matching came up for the first time in the 90s, um, People were asking, uh, you know, will the relation between vacancies and unemployment, the beverage curve, do, do you expect to see anything happening to them? I said, oh, yes, you know, we'll just move to the origin and then eventually we'll have it become a point. It's hardly moved. In fact, even now that most matching takes place because, the, with the, because still the best way of, of getting to learn about people and learning about the job is, is the personal contact. It's going for interview and uh, talking to uh, employers or talking to someone who knows more about what you are doing and, and everything else. What they were saying, uh, actually it was, it, it was your session, I think, that you were saying there is still something yeah. special about person to person. And, and, and it's the same about discovering skills and improving the match uh, person to person, which uh, if I were, um, if I were re re rewriting my <laughs> various matching papers, I would probably emphasize more the um, the fixed cost of learning through personal contact, which I think I only have in one paper actually, the last one, <laughs> the one that was published in uh, right, we haven't got much 2009. Time, but, yeah. uh, man behind uh, near the back, that's it. Hi, um, yeah, my name's Andrew. Um, really good day. Um, I'm a coach and. I run workshops across Europe and stuff. Um, one thing I've noticed with a lot of executives, and my particular interest is stress and resilience, um, is that when you actually speak to them, the main thing is that there's just too much going on. It's too fast. And in fact, the actual solution is often to slow down. And that's the same in innovation, is there's a lot of product, there's a lot of work going on, but there's not a lot of outcomes. There's a lot of hours being done, but not a lot of productivity. I just wondered, did you look at the, the, the concept of ikigai or flow state? the Japanese concept of ikigai, of being engaged in work, and the flow state in terms of stretch and skills and uh, being challenged. And that's actually where happiness comes from. I just wonder whether you looked at that in your work. No, no, we, we, we haven't as yet. Of course, we are waiting for um, survey results that we're doing two surveys, both of employers and um, employees independently, actually. We're not matching them. And... Um, and then when we get the results, we're going to uh, s summarize the outcome. If we find that uh, that's the case, you know, we're completely open to it. But I, I, I have to say a, a, a priori, you know, hearing before I see the surveys, I, I mean, there is a little bit of, uh, of waste that work, or at least what appears to be waste that is not productive use of ours. But I, I, I doubt it, though, that it's really... Productive because if you know, I mean, I mean, look at it that way. If what you're saying is correct, then people would be getting very bored at work. That's that's what they've done. Are they rather bored or anxious? Well, I mean, if you're bored at work, why don't, can't you find something to do? If, exactly, if because they don't know what they want to do. Well, well, if you follow the principles of good work that we've yes. been talking about all yeah. day, then they will find something to do because well, you give them more autonomy. <laughs> It's a rather sad state, state of affairs, actually, if it's like that. So, so our uh, so our study will, I hope, will have an impact and change all that. Then. Thank you. <laughs> we haven't got much time, so I'd like to. There's a couple of questions over here. Uh, gentleman in the middle, and a lady at the front next. If that's if you can pass that along. Uh, hi there. Um, my name is uh, Nason, uh, co-founder of Demizer, um, which is a knowledge discovery tool. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, earlier that uh, one of the benefits of automation will be that uh, we have there's jobs that um, that will be better at, and those uh, 
automation will free up people to do those jobs. Mm. Uh, Darren shared some results earlier, which showed that um, that wasn't the case, and uh, mainly uh, the results you showed showing, showing the task, mm. um, um, uh, the showing that automation uh, was making meaning that people um, were going back into the workforce and compete for the same jobs and not um, going into new jobs. Um, do you have any ideas on why uh, these new jobs aren't coming to fruition that's, um, mm. that are promised by automation? I think actually it's his, his, his point as well as the one we're making that, uh, that uh, many employers, if not both, are still treating labor as a, as a cost, as a production cost, and they're cutting them down. And, and, and that's, that, that's the mentality, that's the culture that has to change, that your workers are... are are your biggest asset it's your human capital you know i mean economists invented the idea of human capital in the early 60s and although they're talking about human capital when it comes to education they're not talking about it when it comes to being employed you know the what what, what is a firm a firm is is it's a it's a unit that combines physical capital with human capital and there is some management on top that play the role of the matchmaking role and you get output out, and if you do it like that, then you will know that what we see now, which is what you are saying, is, it is, not, uh, is not optimal. It's what Darren was saying. So that, I mean, that's the line that we've been uh, pushing uh, more, that, that think more about your workers as one of your best resources. Yeah. Can we pass the mic down to, oh, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, so Kat Barnard. I worked in recruitment for a long time and I just want to come back to this point about um, algorithms and hiring. I think, based on like career and so on, that the primary problem with all of this is um, that most job descriptions are written um, as shopping lists of skills requirements mm. and um, most algorithms don't, incorporate the full taxonomy of jobs and each organization as is its right will maybe define a job in a slightly different way so you can get huge variation on what is ostensibly the same skills requirements but ultimately and this does boil down to the point of well-being and happiness human beings aren't square pegs they are um, rounded and they are continuously developing and expanding their skills and their potential mm. and their wants and mm. hopes and dreams. And I think until we crack that nut, mm. and I'm not entirely sure how technology will help us do it, but actually that is, that is the, the nub of the matter as far as I can see, is how do we create roles for people that allow them to flourish and deliver their best mm. um, work when, as we all are, we're continuously, perpetually kind of evolving and growing and adapting. and and so I see recruitment as a function of human resources and organizational development and organizational flourishing as completely broken at the moment. And back to Eric's point about, you know, being actually the best hires are when somewhat nepotistically um, somebody is able to refer somebody in. Mm -hmm. That's far more effective than relying on an algorithm which technically one would hope would remove bias hmm. it's a complex problem and i don't really know what the answer is well well it's very complex and, and we're nowhere near solving it completely but as long as we're moving in the, in the right direction and what i was saying about ai before is that is that with the capacity we have now to record individual characteristics based on what you are doing all that we have we're going to be much more able to match more of those to match more of those characteristics than uh, than we did in the past but we we're, we're no nowhere uh, achieving the, the goal and that's why you see so much going on now and so analysis of the data actually educating um internally within organizations educating around what the data means and what it could mean so not necessarily you know, it's raw form data, but mm. what does it mean? And, and actually, that's quite an interesting point because, you know, we see um, employee engagement survey software having proliferated across the last decade, mm. but ha mm. it has, doesn't seem to have moved the needle forward in terms of the extent mm. to which people feel engaged. So I wonder if part and parcel of what we need to do next is 
provide more education around how to interpret data and then operationalize it Can I just for the pick good. Up your point? So we haven't got much time. Sorry. So we've yeah. got um, that. The, Chris, could you take that with would mandating employee happiness, well-being, skills reporting for businesses help to create a better environment for automation productivity initiatives? That, 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 that is um, the, it's definitely the, the, the case, and that's what employers are saying yeah. as well now, that, that if you manage to, to, to get the employees yeah. to, to be better matched and to give them more freedom to operate, once you know they have those skills, you give them more freedom to operate within the company, then it will be a lot more creative and a lot easier, more creative and more productive applying the automation uh, technologies and in introducing new uh, automation um, uh, machinery and, and, and technologies in your uh, workplace and um, increasing your productivity. Uh, to, to go back to this, though, you put it actually, what you said at the end is, is really the crux of the matter, which is that it's the value of data. The, the, it, the data is extremely valuable, and when it comes to describing human beings, it's probably the most, com you need the most complicated data sets that you can get that we still don't have the ability to, um, uh, to, to do manually, definitely. The only thing we can say is that we've got a lot more capacity now to store and process that data through AI. So the more data we feed onto a, a machine with AI, the more... Um, likely we are to come with something better than we had in the past. Now, of course, that creates uh, loads and loads of issues about, about uh, privacy, uh, confidentiality, would you trust uh, someone? Because we are not technicians. Uh, there's got to be some technician who, can, who holds that data. You know, it could be Google, for example, that collects all that data from what we do. Do you, do you trust them to have more and more and more so that they give you a good match at work at, uh, at work who knows what else they will use it to match against you which are issues how you combine the the sort of human side of it if you like with the need to process the data in the best possible way to give to, to get a good match between uh, uh, between what you have and what the employer uh, wants in the job Chris I'm, I'm conscious of time I'd like to end on this question because mm. we haven't mentioned frictions once oh, what wow. might the potential frictions be in labor markets of the future actually the the, the potential frictions are always, they're always based on information and data for the reasons we, we just said and what we are discovering and um, it, it's it's quite it's quite something actually because when um, when this um, approach the friction approach first started in the late uh, 60s, you know, with people like Phelps, uh, Net, Net Phelps and others in the, in the States. And then, and, and then when I took it up for my PhD a, a few years later, people were telling me also at, at the LSE that it's, it's, it's not a, an important enough problem. You know, I mean, we're calling it imperfect information at that time, you know, like equilibrium under imperfect information. I would say, no, it's not important. You know, you, you told me, I mean, how much important, how much difference will it make if you assume that we don't know, that we know a probability distribution describing something instead of the actual point, are you sure, blah, blah, and, and then I was just fascinated on decision theory under uncertainty, and that's where I moved into. And, and the, more, the more information we get and the more we progress, the more you realize that it's, it's the big problem and it is what drives the friction after all, which is, which is quite something, it's an eye-opener in fact. Yeah. So the, so the frictions of the future will, will be based on information because it's changing all the time. I think you mentioned it just before. You know, with, every time you get a new technology, then you generate new information about what that technology can do, and you have to learn it every time new. So, it, so it's, it's got to be it's an ongoing learning process of the, the new data and an on, on, ongoing uh, uh, processing of that uh, data and, um, and and I think that's also the potential for, for us losing control to the machines in that they'll be able to process the information uh, much better and much faster than what we do and uh, what do we do? Chris, 
<laughs> thank you. Cheer you up. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Don't so give it to the military. <laughs> I'm, that's the I'm gonna hand over to Anna to close the conference. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>